Hello, and welcome back to my Q&A video series about the Pandas library in Python. And today, I'm just answering questions from the YouTube comments. And I've done a video like this once before, and people seem to like it, so I am doing it again. So, first question from Joshua. Uh, question is, I was wondering if you can do a video to explain how to read the pandas docs. Okay, um, so my first tip with using the pandas documentation is to get to the right page. The usually the easiest way is to Google it, and rather than going to the pandas documents and then searching that way. So that's how I do it. So we're just going to go to Google, and you should just type pandas space the name of the function, okay? So if we say pandas read uh, read CSV and hit enter, um, you're, you'll see these results and you'll want to make sure to choose the one uh, usually with the latest version. So right now it's 0.18.1, but note that um, Google indexes previous versions, so you'll wanna make sure to get the one uh, that's most current. So we'll go ahead and click on that. And there's a couple things I want to highlight about this page. First um, is that when you see the name of the function and it just says pandas.readcsv, this is telling you that it's a top level function su such that you to use it, you're gonna type, if you've imported pandas as pd, you're gonna type pd.readcsv to run it, okay? So that's the first thing I want you to notice. The second is it's got this definition that tells you all the parameters, and our first parameter is a required parameter, which we know because there's no default, uh, whereas the rest of these are our um, optional parameters, and it tells you the default. So the default sep is comma, the default delimiter is none, etc. Okay. Then below this, there will usually be a short um, summary of the function, uh, sometimes with links. And below that, it will describe each one of the parameters. Um, and this is super useful to read through and understand. Okay. So that's um, most of what I do with the pandas documents. Uh, I want to show you a couple other things about them. Um, first, and let's go back and do a, uh, a different Google search. Um, and let's search for pandas drop. And uh, let's go to that page. And what I just wanna highlight here is that if you're on a page that says pandas.dataframe.drop, that is a data frame method. In other words, to run it, let's say you have a data frame UFO, um, if you want to use the drop method, you're gonna say UFO.drop, okay? Not PD.drop, you're gonna say UFO.drop because drop is a data frame method as we can see here, okay? And we can contrast that with a uh, series method, like let's do uh, value counts and search for that. And when we go to this page, we'll see that, okay, value counts is a series method, okay? So uh, next thing I wanna say about the pandas documents is about the API reference, probably the most useful page in the documentation for me. And there's a link right here, and you can also find a link right here, or you can just Google for pandas API reference. But click on that page, and this is a list of basically every function there is in pandas. And um, uh, the things I use it for, it's really good for finding functions similar to something you're already familiar with. So if I'm thinking, well, there's this read CSV, I wonder what the other readers are in pandas. I'll just do a control F to search and say read underscore and then uh, we'll find, okay, read Excel, read JSON, read HTML, read HDF, et cetera, et cetera. So that's uh, one thing I find useful. 
And probably my favorite thing on this API reference page is the list of string methods. I kind of use it as an index to all the string methods. So to find those, all I do is I type str period, and I know I'll go to this section string handling, and I can just click on it there. And now, and we can close this, but now I'm in this section of string handling where I can see every uh, string method. Okay. So um, you'll notice there's actually a ton of things in the left sidebar here. Um, the what's new, once you've been using pandas for a while, I would encourage you to read what's new, um, either to catch up on the past couple versions or every time a new version is released so you know what has changed and new functions you might be interested in. So I would do that once you've got a bit of experience with pandas. Um, the other thing of note is that uh, most of these, they're quite long tutorials essentially on different topics like working with missing data or group by or merge, join, and concatenate. Uh, they tend to be really long and have a lot of detail in them, but if you take the time to go through them, you'll actually learn a lot about that topic and how to work with it in Pandas, okay? So, on to the next question. And the question here, it looks like UFO.isNull and PD.isNullUFO has the same result but one is calling a function of the object and the other is using the object as an argument. Is this a special case because is null takes the data set as an argument? Okay, um, let's, let's actually use the pandas API reference to help us investigate this, okay? So ufo.isNull versus pd.isNullUFO, okay? So let's go to the API reference and search for is null and uh, what I've got here is this, um, this thing that says top level missing data, and it says is null obj. So a top level function means that it's called by doing pd dot something. So this is pd dot is null, and this is telling us that we pass it an object and it will detect missing values in that object. Okay. Now, uh, there are other entries in the API reference for is null. We can scroll down or go to the next um, uh, search result and we see that it's also a series method, okay, series.isNull. Go down further, it's a data frame method, is null, okay? So there are different ways to use it. Um, one is as a series method, one is as a data frame method, and one is as a top level method. And let's actually see this in code to make sure we're clear on this. So I'm ju just going to import pandas as pd, and then we're going to say ufo equals pd.read csv bit.ly slash ufo reports. And um, Let's just do the two commands that uh, he was asking about. So pd dot is null ufo, and we'll just put dot head on the end. So that's checking for missing values, and it was true for these ones and false for the others. And we can we'll just take a look at the head uh, just so you can see this. Here are the missing values, these five, um, and let's compare that with ufo.isNull.head. And you'll see it produces the same result. So it's somewhat common in pandas to be able to access a function as a method of a data frame or a series, or as a top level function. You can use either, whatever you prefer. I tend to use the methods, but either approach is fine. All right, on to the next question. And Daniel asks, it seems to me that the pandas team is split between inclusive ranges and ex exclusive ranges. Zero colon four is different from loc to iloc. Do you know what the reasoning is behind this? Okay, uh, excellent question. Um, here is what he is talking about, okay? If we say ufo.loc, 
and we pass it the slice, I want rows zero through four, all columns. This is label-based indexing. And label-based indexing with loc is inclusive on both sides. So it includes the zero and it includes the four. And then this is just all columns, OK? Whereas if you use iloc, integer location, meaning positional-based indexing, and you say 0 colon 4 comma colon, you will get 0, 1, 2, 3. Because uh, iloc with a slice is inclusive on the left and exclusive on the right. So he's asking, why is that the case? And I want to explain that to you, OK? So pandas is built on top of NumPy. And pandas, whenever possible, tries to follow NumPy conventions. So iloc is exclusive on the right because that's how NumPy does its slicing. So for instance, um, it it turns out that ufo.values, so it's a data frame attribute, dot values shows you the underlying NumPy array for a data frame. Okay? And if I slice that like this, colon 4, um, I get rows 0, 1, 2, 3, and all columns. So in other words, iloc is just copying what NumPy uses for slicing. This is actually NumPy syntax that um, pandas reuses for iloc. Okay? So inclusive on the left, exclusive on the right. Now, why does NumPy do that? Well, I think that's because it's how Python's range does it. So uh, if you say um, list range 0, 4, you'll get 0, 1, 2, 3, because range inclusive on the left, exclusive on the right. Okay, So uh, Python did it, thus NumPy did it, thus Pandas did it with iloc. But if iloc works this way, why doesn't loc do the same thing? Why is loc inclusive on both sides? And let me show you why that actually makes sense. Uh, let's do ufo.head. And um, let's say that we want to use loc to select all rows and columns city through state. Okay, So I would say ufo.loc, and I want all rows, and I want city through state. Okay, And that works just as expected. Now, this tells us why slices are inclusive on both sides for loc? And the answer is this. If it was inclusive on the left but exclusive on the right, we would have to say city colon time to get city through state because it would exclude the last one. But if you read that code, you would be so confused because the reader of the code doesn't know that state comes before time. And I wanted city through state, so I wrote city through time. It just makes no sense um, when your index, either your dot index or dot columns, are not consecutive uh, numbers. Okay, So because of that, it makes more sense for loc for these uh, slices to be inclusive on both sides. In summary, the logic for loc and iloc both independently make sense for why they invented it that way. It's just a little annoying, as the commenter mentioned, that the logic between the two conflicts. And you just have to memorize um, uh, the way the logic works when you're doing slices. Okay. All right. Final question for today from Giancarlo. And he says, 
Could you do a video about handling large CSV files in pandas? For example, is there a practical way to randomly sample rows? Okay, so I'm not going to talk about dealing with large um, files in general with this video. I'll cover that in the future. But I will talk about random sampling. So this applies regardless of data frame size. Let's say you want to take a random sample. Okay, so it turns out there is a data frame method called sample. And I can just say ufo.sample, and I can say n equals three, and I will get three random rows. Now note that every time you run this, you will get three different rows. And if you're doing this at home, you'll see three different rows than, you're, than I'm seeing, okay? But if you're familiar with the concept of reproducibility, you can use the random state parameter for reproducibility. So we're just going to say random state equals 42. And what you'll notice when I use a random state is that every time I run it, and sorry for the, um, uh, for the screen to move every time, but you'll notice that every time I run it, I'm getting the same exact results. Now, if you are running this exact same line of code with random state equals 42, you should be getting the same thing as well. So that's uh, reproducibility, okay? Now, you can also, let's say you don't want a set number of rows, but you want a fraction of rows. I can say ufo.sample frac equals zero, uh, 0 0.75, and we'll say random state equals 99. And now I'm actually getting 75% of the rows, okay? Um, and so that's super useful that you can either specify the number of rows or the fraction, though you can't use those together, okay? So as always, I'm gonna end with a bonus. And the bonus is as follows. If you are someone who does machine learning and is familiar with the concept of train test split, meaning I want a uh, certain percentage of rows in the training set and the rest of the rows not overlapping in the testing set. I'm gonna show you how to do that with pandas. So let's go ahead and just store this random sample of 75% as train, okay? And the thing is, you can't just say, oh, frac equals 0.25 and get the other 25%. It doesn't work that way, okay? You would just get a random 25%, and you need a non-overlapping 25%. You need all the other rows for your testing set. So how do you do that? I'm going to show you the code. We're going to say test equals ufo.loc. And then I'm going to say, what rows do I want? I'm going to type ufo.index dot is in train dot index colon and then in front of this I'm gonna add this tilde so what rows do I want I want these rows and instead of telling you how this works I want you to think through this and investigate it and figure it out and if you're having trouble figuring out some particular um, uh, part of it I want you to let me know in the comments and I'll help you through, but I want you to try to figure out what is going on in this line of code, and I think you'll learn something new just from doing that. But you will find that train contains 75% of the rows, and test now contains 25% of the rows, and those 25% of the rows are completely exclusive of the training set. Okay? So, that is it for today. Thank you so much for joining me. As always, please click subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this. Please leave me a comment or a question below, and I'd love to uh, be of help. Uh, but that's it. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope to see you again soon.